Brand new reporting in the New York Times sheds light on the years of Attorney General Merrick Garland's thorough but cautious pursuit of justice following the January 6th attack that eventually culminated in a historic indictment of a former president. The Times reports the DOJ's work pitted, quote, a quintessential rule follower determined to restore the department's morale and independence against the ultimate rule breaker, Mr. Trump, who was intent on bending the legal system to his will and trying to avoid even the smallest mistakes Mr. Garland might have made one big one, not recognizing that he could end up racing the clock like much of the political world and official Washington. He and his team did not count on Mr. Trump's political resurrection after January 6th and his fast victory in the 2024 Republican presidential primary, which has complicated the prosecution and given the former president leverage in court. The reporting recounts that the DOJ started first from the bottom and worked upward, then employed a follow-the-money strategy, and then went after a more untested legal path, focusing on election fraud. Complicating matters, the very public showing by the 1-6 Select Committee, a stark contrast to the behind-the-scenes, slower-moving DOJ about that. The Times reports Mr. Garland has said time and again that the committee's hearings had no impact on the Trump investigation. The department was motivated only by the need to get it right, which entailed imagining the mistakes that we could make and making sure that we don't make them. Joining us now, former top official at the Department of Justice and MSNBC legal analyst Andrew Weissman, plus former senior advisor to Attorney General Merrick Garland and MSNBC justice and legal affairs analyst Anthony Coley, and former acting assistant attorney general for national security at the Justice Department and MSNBC legal analyst Mary McCord. It is great to see you all. Andrew, let's start off with why this matters at this moment. More from the New York Times. Quote, the Supreme Court's decision to review Mr. Trump's claims of presidential immunity in the case has now threatened to push the trial deep into the campaign season or beyond, raising the possibility that voters will make their choice between Mr. Trump and President Biden in November without Mr. Trump's guilt or innocence being established. It has resurfaced a question that has long dogged Mr. Garland. What took so long? Andrew, can you answer that especially after reading this piece? Uh, no, I can't. But I, I think the way when I read this piece, um, I sort of had several reactions. First, Please. I do think it's important that, that people realize that the, the truth here is not probably black and white. Um, the, in other words, it's not possible to say that the Department of Justice did nothing. For, for one, they prosecuted hundreds and hundreds of people sort of at the ground level and and slightly above that because the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys were difficult and righteous cases. And they also did open some, investi some investigative avenues and were exploring certain things prior to the January 6 um, hearings. But that being said, there's just no getting around that they made public statements um, at the time about how they were doing a bottom-up investigation as if they were going after an organized crime family or Enron and looking to see if they could sort of flip people from from the bottom to the top. And I remember writing for the New York Times an op-ed saying, after, especially after Cassidy Hutchinson testified and there were reports that the Department of Justice didn't know anything about her, that that was just the wrong approach. And I think I'm I, not to pat myself on the back, but the reason I think that's so clear is when you look at the indictment that was ultimately brought, it is anything but a bottom up investigation. So I think they just really did not approach this in the right way at the outset. And so I think that the that's one of the reasons that we have this timing crunch now. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that the Supreme Court might not have delayed things um, or that we Judge Cannon wouldn't have delayed things. But there's, I think there's no question that if they had um, acted with the alacrity that you see from Jack Smith, who, um, you know, who brought the case quite quickly, um, that we wouldn't be in the exact position we're in now. At least that's my opinion reading from the outside. Anthony Coley, I see you practically jumping out of your chair. 
<laughs> you know, Andrew Weissman is as smart as they come. In terms of this quarter uh, Monday morning quarterbacking, uh, I, uh, I I Monday morning Monday quarterback with the best of them. So here's my take. I'm not a lawyer like Andrew or or Mary, but my sense of this is that history will ultimately be the judge. And right now, I think it's premature to really say whether or not Merrick Garland was right or wrong in his approach here. What is clear to me, based on this particular reporting, and from the very first paragraph, Paragraph, Alicia, we see um, that Mayor Garland and Lisa Monaco put in place from the start of their tenure uh, people and processes to ensure early in their tenure that Donald Trump and people around him were being um, investigated aggressively. That's the takeaway from this report. And the other thing that I would add, because Andrew mentioned uh, Cassidy Hutchinson and a report, I believe it was in the New York Times, not speaking specifically about that report, but it's important to note that people cannot always believe everything that they read about active, ongoing criminal investigations at the Justice Department. And this was, to be frank with you, this was my great frustration leading um, communications at DOJ, Alicia, because um, sometimes people would come into my office, reporters, and they would say, Colin, we're about to report um, X, Y, and Z. We saw X person go into a grand jury and they said, why? Why do you say about that? DOJ has very stringent rules that preclude any DOJ official from uh, engaging at all in that type of conversation. And that example, Alicia, I couldn't even I couldn't even confirm the even mere existence of a grand jury. And so what the public is left with in that situation and that type of example is at best a lopsided view of what's happened and at worst something that is totally wrong and that is not consistent with what DOJ um, is doing in a criminal matter. So that's very important for people to know that first impressions about what DOJ is doing on active criminal investigations are uh, frequently wrong, and they don't always include the side of the Justice Department. Mary, I want to look at one of the strategies used by DOJ as described by The Times, quote, department leaders believe that the best way to justify prosecuting Mr. Trump and the Willard plotters was to find financial links between them and the rioters because they thought it would be more straightforward and less risky than a case based on untested election interference charges, according to people with knowledge of the situation. But that conventional approach rooted in prosecutorial muscle memory yielded little. Talk about that approach, Mary to investigating. Well, first, I want to footstep something that Anthony said, which is that, I mean, I just think we really do have to take uh, with a bit of a grain of salt reporting on internal DOJ investigations. I mean, until this reporting, you know, based on previous reporting by other uh, other media outlets, you know, you would think that the department was doing basically nothing except for going after the rioters and trying to work their way up. I have always thought that that couldn't have been the case. There had to have been more going on there. This reporting certainly suggests there is more going on there, uh, but we don't know exactly what. And of course, follow the money is a tried and true um, uh, investigative practice, whether you're talking about gang charges or white collar offenses. And, you know, in the same reporting about that uh, financial links between the rioters and the Trump um, those in Trump's inner circle not panning out. You also see quotes in that article uh, saying that the Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco was was you know pressuring the investigative team. What are we going to have by Labor Day? So I think we see you know reporting that's not entirely clear to us about what particular angles might have been being taken. And there certainly was at least some reason to believe that uh, groups like the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, more than some reason to believe, were connected to those within Mr. Trump's circle. I mean, they had provided security for for Roger Stone um, and for others, Mike Flynn. Um, there had there have been other connections that have been uh, described that show money being used to fly various people into, D into uh, D.C. for some of these events. Um, leading up to January 6, previous events in DC. So, it's not a crazy strategy, but I think what's important here is that it, you know, that when that didn't pan out, there was a pivot and we really see that coming um at the end, I guess of uh 2021 and into 2022 when they as you indicated at the top of the of the segment they realize we let's let's start looking into this fraudulent elector scheme and coming at it from that perspective, which ultimately pr proved 
much more fruitful. So I think, you know, it's just really hard, I think, to second guess the various uh, strategies, particularly when even with this reporting, which seems to be good reporting, um, we still don't know everything that's going on in the Department of Justice.